After breakfast, we tidy up our weapons. We stow our ammunition. After all, we won't have to sit idle. As soon as we are replenished with men, we will again fight our way to Rostov to help G.K. Madoyan's battalion, which is stuck at the station. As if guessing my thoughts, an officer from the brigade headquarters entered the room and reported, Sniper Belyakov is allocated to guard the brigade commander. The brigade commander wanted to break through with a reconnaissance team in burning Rostov and, to understand the situation there, to contact Madoyan's battalion. When you return from your mission, come to me, Tuz jealously admonished me. The sniper has a business in the company. At dusk, we crawled across the Don. To the left on the ice, something blackens. What is it? We keep our weapons at the ready. There are not many of us, about 20 men. Kombrig Bulgakov is with us. From second to second, we are waiting for a fight with the enemy. I know that this fight will not be easy, but surprisingly, we crawl across the Don without a single shot. We silently sneak along one of the streets towards Verknogonilovskaya. The soldiers ahead of us are called out in a menacing whisper. Stop! Who's coming? Our own! Our own! Hastily, also in a half-whisper, the soldiers answer. It turns out that we ran into the headquarters of the battalion of the 248th Rifle Division. Here we learned that the station building was occupied by fascists. The battalion of Madoyan, together with other units, moved to the shop of the steam locomotive repair plant and is fighting there. Behind the wall of a neighbouring house, a sharp machine gun burst sounds. For some reason, I perceive it as the barking of an angry dog from the alley. The Germans are here, very close, whispers to me an unfamiliar fighter. Don't yawn. The scouts crawled away to make contact with Madoyan. We waited for them, on duty in the corners of the house, but the scouts came back. They confirmed that Madoyan's battalion was still fighting but needed help. We began our withdrawal. We had to delay under the streetcar bridge. Patrols were walking along the tracks. I silently put a cartridge in the chamber and felt the grenade. We freeze. We can hear the water of the unfrozen brook gurgling. Hitlerite patrolmen are heavily stepping over the bridge and I suppose are looking under the bridge with apprehension. But now the footsteps are moving away. We go down to the Don, crawling on the ice, skirting the ice holes. On the right, 200 metres away, a rocket flares up, but we remain unnoticed. The dawn catches us already on the shore. And in Rostov, ominously boom explosions, fires are burning. The Germans are blowing up buildings. The brigade commander left me and three scouts on the shore. If you see a kraut, hit him, he told me and the scouts to watch everything that will happen on the other shore. Report changes to the headquarters. I took a position at the booth with a skull and crossed bones. I chew some breadcrumbs, drink water from a flask. It's getting light. On the ice, almost in the middle of the river, I see a broken wagon. At its right wheel there is a thermos, a box of ammunition. Horses are lying next to it with their hooves up. The rider himself is gone. He managed to escape. So this is what was blackening on the left when we crawled across the Don. I looked through the eyepiece at the buildings on the other bank. A bursting bullet slams on a transformer panel with a skull painted on it. If they're shooting at me, it means they're shooting badly. If a sniper is shooting at me, it's bad, I ponder. But I act strictly according to the rule. If you are detected by an enemy shooter and there is an opportunity to change your position, you should change it. I crawl away about 50 metres. Again, I carefully watch the shore. Fascists walk there alone and in groups. They are more than 400 metres away. A fascist appears on an open stretch of the street. Who is he? An officer or a soldier? You can't tell from afar. Holding my breath, I take aim, pull the trigger. The fascist falls back as if he is caught on something sharp and falls as if reluctantly to the ground. Nobody crawls to the dead man, so he was a private, but the private raises his arm, tries to get up and can't. Wounded then. Orderlies with stretchers come running out from behind the house. They hurriedly put the wounded man on the stretcher. They run back in a hurry. To shoot or not to shoot? 
I know, fascists bomb our hospitals, sanitary trains exterminate the wounded, they killed my brother. But these are fascists, people with inhuman morals, and I'm a Soviet sniper. I am aiming at the first orderly. I feel that I'll kill him and then the second one. But that's how it happens at the front. A man is in the crosshairs and he leaves alive. I lowered my rifle and didn't regret that I hadn't fired. On an elevated place I notice a group of Hitlerites. Nearby stands a tank. It is painted in white stripes, some kind of box is attached to the shutters. People in black, apparently tankers, maybe SS. Here I do not think long. I carefully calibrate the distance, point the crosshairs at the extreme, waving his hand. The Nazi splashed his hands as if he had slipped on ice. The others were blown away. Strong sniper, cleanly worked. It was the scouts who crawled up. One of them stares, mesmerised at the smoking shell casing thrown into the snow. What is he thinking? Did you notice, sniper, that the Krauts are running somewhere behind Gnilovskaya? No other way. They're winding up their rods. Maybe they are, but there's still a lot of them at the wharf. When they start shooting in vain, you know they're retreating. I know from experience. The artillery started beating from the reeds, shells whistling overhead and burst not far from the tank. The artillerymen must have detected this target too. And on our left, heavy guns opened fire. It is the Cossacks of the Cavalry Corps of Lieutenant General N. Kirichenko, forcing the Don to block the fascists' withdrawal from Rostov. Hitlerites really began to behave strangely. Some open indiscriminate fire, others, like hares, looping, run back and hide behind the hill. I shoot in the back of a hesitant fascist, and he remains lying on the snow. It seems that the Hitlerites have no more time for him. At the side of the Green Island, behind the railroad bridge, a strong firefight breaks out, and by noon nobody appears on the other shore. The scouts crawled away to the headquarters to report on the situation. On February 14th, Rostov-on-Don was liberated. The troops of our army entered the city. With difficulty I found on the way to Chaltir my second battalion, which is now commanded by Lieutenant Tuz. Combat Oreshkin was wounded in action. I find Vanya Gurov and Sema Machukov. Friends congratulate me on my success. Great you them, says Vanya Gurov. Sixteen SS destroyed. That's right, don't walk at a slant. You'll stomp your boots, you foul enemy. I learned from my friends that Snipper Volodya Spesivtsev was badly wounded in Rostov and was rescued at the risk of his life by the locals. Our way lay in the direction of Taganrog, Matviv Kurgan, to the unknown Mius front, about which there was already a lot of talk. New Brigade Commander The thaw began. The ground turned into an impenetrable mess. Cars and wagons got stuck. Despite everything, the 28th Army was advancing. The fascist troops surrendered position after position. Having liberated Matvev Kurgan, a large settlement, on which the fascists pinned special hopes, our units rushed to Anastasievka. Fierce battles were fought on the Mius frontier, and Mius, long silent Mius, was announced by the roar of guns. It was 20 kilometres from Matvev Kurgan. In our company came a military doctor, Ekaterina Ivanovna Lavrova. She became aware that on the wagon lay a soldier wounded in the leg. Lavrova decided to immediately examine the wounded man. She was followed by a nurse, a short grey-eyed girl. The soldiers noticed the medics in white coats from afar. They hid the wounded man in the bottom of the wagon, covering him with a cloak. But the military doctor, as they say, can't be fooled. Someone but Lavrova knew that the wounded, not wanting to part with their comrades, often stayed to be treated in their companies. Approaching the wagon, Ekaterina Ivanovna asked, Where is the San instructor? Why do you need him? Slyly squinting his eyes, answered the rider, a round-faced fighter in a half-coat. But! he shouted at the horse and swung his whip. Stop! commanded Lavrova. What's under the cloak? Nothing much, said the soldier evasively. Lavrova, without waiting for an answer, threw off the cloak herself. Under it lay a fighter with a bandaged leg, 
and embarrassedly curved his lips. Why not in the hospital? This is a crime, raised her voice military doctor. You may get gangrene. Doctor, understand. I don't want to lose my comrades. They'll take me to the sandbat, from there to the hospital, and goodbye to the unit, and I've travelled so far with it. Doctor, understand. My dear company. Enough, Lavrova interrupted him. Now for hospital treatment. I can't, Doctor, I can't leave my company. How can't you understand that? My wound is a trifle. The bone is intact. The soldiers gathered around the wagon. They looked sympathetically at the soldier and disapprovingly at the doctor. Some tried to persuade Lavrova, but she was inexorable. I'll report to the brigade commander. Who needs a combrig? came a loud voice from behind. Everyone turned around. In front of us stood a short black-haired officer. He had lively brown eyes and a straight, handsome nose. This, as it turned out, and was the new commander, Lieutenant Colonel Mikhail Ilyich Dubrovin. We are used to Bulgakov, a man of already venerable age, but here is a very young man. Did you see? whispers in my ear Petty Officer Tarasov. The new brigade commander. He fought at Stalingrad. They say he served with Eremenko himself. Pay attention to the overcoat at the back. See the holes? Bullet holes. I heard a German sniper shot him. What are you whispering about? The commander-in-chief turned to Tarasov, but when he noticed the sniper's rifle, he immediately asked, Sniper? Yes, Comrade Lieutenant Colonel. Last name? I introduced myself. I've heard about you, about your hunting. I like snipers. Only the kind who hit the target with the first shot. I've been shot three times, and as you can see, I'm alive. Just a scare, that's all. So what's your argument? The lieutenant colonel looked at Lavrova. The military doctor began to explain. Combrig, listening to the girl, then stern face, then looked at her with a smile. Then he squinted his eyes and asked, And what, doctor? If in fact will not return a soldier to the company? Think of it, for the company is his home, isn't it? And who runs away from home? A bad family man. Isn't that right? Of course it's true. The soldiers became animated. But the question of where to treat a soldier, in a hospital or at the company, is not my competence. It must be determined by a doctor, depending on the degree of injury. Now send the wounded man to the hospital and treat him. When he's cured, come to me. I'll make the referral myself and definitely to the fourth company. Thank you, thank you very much, comrade commander, we replied. Attention, which showed the new commander to the wounded, caused lively conversations among us. All agreed on one thing. Lieutenant Colonel is a sensitive man. I particularly describe in detail the case on the road because the wounded soldier was Alyosha Adrov, Mipia from Kumilga, a village in the Stalingrad region, who later became a famous sniper. Mius' everyday life, the 28th Army, now the Southern Front, was ordered to take the defence along the bank of the Mius River to the right of Matveev Kurgan. The defence here was difficult. The precipitous right bank of the river dominated over the left one, and it gave an opportunity to the fascists, occupying positions on the heights, to organise a good observation. All along the Mius front, so Hitler's command christened the defensive line on the Mius, was dug a continuous line of trenches, and ahead of it made cells for riflemen, machine gunners, snipers, connected by communication lines. From the stories of commanders, as well as scouts, including Vanya Gurov, we learned that the defence on this section of the front has its own peculiarities and signs. You are watched by hundreds of eyes from the slits of bunkers, pillboxes, all sorts of reinforced concrete hoods and many other structures. The terrain is shot. Carefully camouflaged sniper points have been set up. Here you need extreme caution and attention. The fourth company was now commanded by Senior Lieutenant A.P. Pohiton, a career officer. Accustomed to twos, I experienced his departure. However, the commander did not forget our company. He often visited it, was interested in its life. 
and now Ace is in the company, and on his orders we arrived with sniper Pavel Kromov. Pavel Kromov, my classmate, a young man of short stature with a tenacious look of brown eyes. He came to the company recently from the hospital. I became fast friends with him. Kromov something resembled my friend Pavlik Dronov, shot accurately and had on the account of seven Hitlerites destroyed in the battles for Rostov. As a company commissar, I often gave Kromov assignments. He treated their fulfilment very conscientiously. He issued combat leaflets about the distinguished, picked up interesting articles about snipers, which he read to his combat friends. Out of 47 members of the company's Komsomol, he was, perhaps, the most active and enterprising. Combat Tuz, now a senior lieutenant, led us behind the cliff, where we could speak louder. In the defence of the battle tone should set the snipers, began Tuz. Here is at least such an opportunity. Hitlerites, and I know it from experience, do not always open trenches in full height. No, no, and over the trench will appear German. One is too lazy to duck down, another is careless when drunk, the third is just showing off. Catch them at gunpoint. We listened attentively to Ace. We had to act in such a strong defence for the first time, but the task is clear to beat the fascists at any opportunity. Now all sleep, ordered Tuz. And at dawn, on the hunt. No enemy must not look in our direction with impunity, be masters of the land. The morning greets us with surprising silence. No one fires. I take my position and look around. Here are machine gunners preparing their positions for battle and next to the gunners masking dead wood and dry grass, freshly dug ground. Two burly fighters in helmets are attaching an anti-tank gun. Slowly they spread grenades, ammunition, kettles in the niches. The brigade's units are literally buried in the ground and, like a compressed spring, are ready at any time to break out and hit the enemy. I take off the protective cap from the sniper's sight. Slowly, one by one, I load five cartridges into the magazine box. I fall down to the eyepiece. Here they are, the enemy trenches, very close. A helmet, wet from the morning fog, glistens above the ground. Maybe the fascist is contemplating the sunrise. How dangerous it is to admire the sunrise on a foreign land. The crosshairs of the sight confidently lays down on the Nazi. Silence. And then the buttstock twitched, as if alive in his hands. The echo of the shot reflected three times the high-rises, the forest, the walls of destroyed houses. The grey-green figure of the fascist straightened up, swayed to the left and collapsed into the trench. The helmets flashed behind the barrier. They're moving, you bastards, Kromov whispered to me. Soon another single shot rang out, and there in the enemy trench at the machine-gun point a soldier who intended to bring a box of cartridges to the machine gun frantically waved his hands. I congratulate my partner on his success. In the first hours of that day, the Nazis were still walking in the trench at full height. They didn't hide their heads. They were peeking out from behind the barrier. However, by noon they became more cautious and showed themselves less and less often. Probably preferred to watch through the periscopes. Well, that does us credit. But we, snipers, were patiently looking for Hitlerites and, as soon as a head appeared, fired. In March, the front newspaper published an article about my duel with a German sniper. The duel with the Nazi supershooter was long and dangerous and almost cost me my life. And it was like this. Spring began early on the Meuse. The fields turned green. The water was breaking the ice on the river and carrying it noisily to the Sea of Azov. Above the trenches now and then there was a sad smirking of cranes flying at a high altitude. Obviously cranes, as well as people, realised the danger of the Meuse estuaries. Water suddenly appeared in the trenches. Each of us created an island of land and sat on it like a hare caught by the flood. In such a position one could not sit for long, and I, squelching on the water, often visited Semyon Marchukov, whose machine-gun crew was attached to the 4th Company, 
and was on the very precipice at the bend of the river. My visits caused a lot of trouble to the men of his squad. The thing is that Semyon Marchukov allowed me to shoot from the machine gun, and the soldiers then had to fill machine gun ribbons. In one of the spring days, I again snuck to the machine gun cell. I see Maxim stands on an earthen platform, carefully camouflaged by dry weeds. It's dangerous to shoot, Semyon warned me. Why? A sniper is shooting. Cunning bastard. If we keep silent, he keeps silent. We start shooting and then it happens. Only spatter from the shield. So it's working on sound. We can't tell where it's coming from. But it hits hard. I can't tell. Let me fire a couple rounds. This time I don't see any reproach in the machine gunner's eyes. And yet they're surprised by my request. It's risky to shoot. If he kills me, who will be responsible? Semyon asks in all seriousness. There can't be two deaths, but we can't avoid one. Semyon reluctantly gives up his place at the machine gun. I know that the Maxim is aimed precisely along the edge of the enemy trench berm. Works like clockwork. Not one fascist went to the other world from his accurate cues. I take the butt plate. I press the trigger and see how the fountains of bullets dance along the trench. And suddenly there was a sharp click in the shield. I carefully examine it and see, in two centimetres from the observation window there is a trace of a bullet. Yes, it's a sniper shooting, I confidently conclude, and a chill goes down my spine. You bet, I was two centimetres away from death. I undertake to track down the fascist sniper and destroy him, and report to the company commander. Look, don't get caught in the crosshairs yourself, warns Senior Lieutenant Pohiton. He allowed me to crawl out to the neutral strip, about which he himself warned all the observers. It is necessary to follow the sniper in the early morning, when the sun illuminates the height and when the rays are sure to blind the eyes of the fascists, I ponder. The night passes in some anxious half-sleep. The morning was beautiful. The sun was warming up. The thawed earth began to float, and milky-coloured smoke stretched into the sky. Clinging to the ground like a scimitar, I crawled behind the barn to be closer to the enemy's defence. I crawled through the tall weeds, almost to the river bank. The sun is getting warmer and warmer. My camouflage raincoat gets tangled under my feet and gets in the way. I notice a snowdrop. I admire it. I can't take my eyes off the flower. I remember my native places, slopes of ravines covered with snowdrops. It's getting stuffy. I want to untie the straps of my cap. Suddenly I felt a blow on my head. Almost simultaneously I hear a shot. A sniper is shooting. A spark flashes through my head. I instantly turn around and roll to the river. I fall off the cliff into the coastal mud. I feel my head. I'm alive. I look at the hole in my hat. Millimetres decided my fate. What a shot. I sigh with relief but immediately a burning resentment overwhelms me. After all, I was on the strip from death. And from whom? From the sniper, whom I volunteered to destroy. My mouth dries with excitement, and cold drops of sweat creep down my face. To die so ridiculously because of a boy's carelessness. I'm like a girl in front of a flower, I scold myself. A warrior. The excitement gradually passes. I ponder how to proceed, they say that bad things don't come without good things. This shot of the enemy sniper finally convinced me that he was firing not from the general trench, but much lower and closer to it. I crawl to the scouts, who have been studying the enemy's defences for a week now. I find Vanya Gurov. I ask him if he knows anything about the German sniper, and immediately I hear the answer. Damn that sniper! No life from him! He won't let me observe the bastard. And yesterday he wounded one of our scouts. Vanya vaguely shows the place where the sniper is shooting from. His assumptions coincide with mine. In parting, he jokingly warns, Keep your head down, spare your crazy head, or you'll have to mend a hole in it. We'll see which of us will have that hole. Me or him, I replied. The next day... 
having chosen a suitable place and camouflaged it, I continue to study the front of the enemy. The sun still generously illuminates the heights. No detail escapes my sight. There are thirteen bushes on the slope of the hill. By one of them darkens a dug-in and a tin can. No, this is not a sniper's point. Would a smart sniper scatter details near him that demarcate his location? It's probably a false nest. Or maybe. Maybe the sly one deliberately chose this position to disorient us. Not far from our trenches, mines are exploding at regular intervals. One, one, two, a third. In the interval between the ruptures, we hear two dry shots. I notice how a small bush in a low place has darkened, as if someone covered it from inside. I remember Lieutenant Stanov's instructions. Take every dark bush under suspicion and watch it closely. There might be an enemy sniper there. A sun bunny flashed faintly. Stop! I say it out loud. It's him, the sniper! My heart sinks at the joyful guess. I curse myself for not suspecting this bush earlier. And it is really something different from the others. I notice a small trench coming from the bush. Where does it go? Nowhere. So the sniper at dawn crawls here on the slope of the height, and the trench is nothing but a way to the toilet. I crawl to Semyon Marchikov and convince him to open fire with a machine gun in thirty minutes, but without risking myself. Once again I calibrate the distance, wipe the optics. Thirty minutes seems like an eternity. Well, why aren't they firing there? Are they asleep or what? I scold the machine gunners in my heart for their slowness. But here the maxim is clearly and long. I concentrate all my attention on the dark bush, and then I notice that it, as if alive, moved a little, hardly noticeable, and moved to the left. The figure of a fascist in a camouflage coat and a spotted helmet appeared. My shot almost merged with the enemy's. Yes. I run to the company commander and bump into him in the trench. Look at the bush, over there. I killed a Nazi sniper. Watch out. Keep your head down, I hear back. Don't be afraid. Look, I killed him. Senior Lieutenant Pohiton examines the bush with binoculars and notices the orphaned rifle of Hitler's supershooter. Let's consider ourselves lucky, Andrei Petrovich said without hiding his joy, and this bitch's nest will be raised to the ground. Company commander by phone reported the coordinates of the secret bush mortars. They did not hesitate to open fire. The camouflage flew into the air. The explosive wave threw away the sniper rifle, and it now lies in full view of everyone as an unnecessary and not at all dangerous object. On the same day, an event took place that I remembered for the rest of my life. I would like to tell more about this event. In the evening, when I returned from hunting, I was informed that I was summoned to the political department of the brigade. I guessed right away, to the party commission for admission to the party. I waited until it was completely dark and got out of the trench and went to a lonely house standing on a small hill. The house did not stand out in any way, and apparently that's why the Nazis did not fire guns at it. There, in a good stone cellar, the political department was housed. The distance to the house was considerable, about five kilometres, and I walked, going over in my memory all the days associated with the preparation for the party. Many hours free from the battle, I painstakingly studied the charter of the party, a short course of history of the All-Union Communist Party. And to better memorise what I read, I told everything to my combat friends. I deeply respected my senior comrades who gave me recommendations, Captain P.S. Kanigin, Deputy Battalion Commander for Political Part, and Lieutenant A. Shivkov, Deputy Company Commander for Political Part. They were very attentive to me, and I was afraid to let them down, to lose their trust. The Secretary of the Komsomol Organization of the Battalion Junior Lieutenant, Nikolai Chaika, showed special care about my combat and ideological growth. He often talked to me on various topics, advised me how and what to talk about with the Komsomol members, wrote about me in the army newspaper, and once sent a touching letter to my mother about my military deeds. 
At the meeting of the party bureau and party meeting, almost no questions were asked. Party activists knew me by concrete deeds. But how is it now? I open the door timidly. In the basement, near a box that replaces the table, sits the head of the political department of the brigade, Lieutenant Colonel A.G. Fastovsky. Nearby, the secretary of the Komsomol organization, Chaika. A light draft moves papers on the lap of Captain Kanigan. He replaces the secretary of the party committee. Courage, Petro, affectionately encourages Kanigan. I tell my biography. I talk about how I studied at secondary school, urged young people to study military science, how I myself passionately loved weapons and studied the three-line rifle at school. And not in vain, said Chaika. That same evening, the head of the political department, Fastovsky, handed me a candidate card. Well, Petro, shook my hand Kanigan, now you are not just a sniper and sniper communist. Always feel responsible to the party. Deeply excited, I left the dugout. Snipers are fighting snipers gathered at the army meeting. The head of the political department of the 28th Army Colonel Nikita Vasilyevich Egorov urged us to increase activity in the destruction of Hitler's soldiers and officers. Shoot like Chechikov, learn to beat the enemy in Chechikov's way. In the address of the participants of the rally, published in the army newspaper Krasnoe Znamia, it was said, the sniper Komsomolets guards Red Army soldier Chechikov for the period of the last battles exterminated 148 German invaders. We urge all fighters of our units to master perfectly the skill of marksmanship, mercilessly destroy Hitler's bandits. After the meeting, the sniper movement got even wider scope. A worthy example again showed Komsomolets Chechikov. He relatively quickly taught Private Lukanov to shoot accurately from ambushes. We carefully read an article about it in the newspaper. For his military exploits, guards Private Dmitry Iosifovich Chechikov was awarded the Order of the Red Banner. Many comrades in arms he taught the hard art of exterminating enemies. It seemed to me that I could never destroy as many fascists as Chechikov, and yet my score was growing. Senior Lieutenant Tuz decided to create a group of the best shooters and organize their training in the art of marksmanship. The initiative of the commander was warmly supported by the communists and Komsomol members. In the group, in addition to Sergeant Pavel Koromov, included Sergeants Alexei Adrov, who arrived from the sanitary company, and Yegor Bajanov, as well as six privates. I was assigned to train the riflemen. In the morning, I took the future snipers to the woods. We went down to the river on a steep slope. Here, no one could disturb us unnecessarily. I told them how to camouflage a sniper, how to detect him, showed them how to aim correctly. I recalled everything I had been taught in my time by Lieutenant Stanov, the head of the Brigade Sniper School. Special attention was paid to the development of such important qualities for a sniper as caution and patience. If you camouflage well, you save yourself and kill the enemy. I repeated what I had heard many times. If you disguise yourself, you will destroy yourself. There were tactical games. For example, one of the fighters secretly from the others picked up and equipped a sniper position. His comrades were assigned the task of detecting this position. The one who discovered it first was given the right to select and camouflage the sniper position himself. I tried with my students to shoot at an insignificant target, a nickel, a rifle casing. I did not forget to remind the saying, if there is patience, there will be skill. Of course, I closely followed the newspapers. I cut out from them materials about snipers Chechikov, Milishchus, Nosov, Babkin, and read these materials aloud. We carefully studied Chechikov's method of roaming point, the essence of which was that the sniper has not one but several nests and fires from one of them, then from another. This gives the enemy the impression that several snipers, not just one, are firing. It is very difficult to detect a roaming sniper. The enemy does not know from which point the next shot will be fired. 
Alyosha Adrov excelled in shooting. He put bullets, as they say, in the bull's eye. Alyosha was taller than all of us. A nice guy with clear blue eyes and a charming smile, he somehow immediately disposed of himself. Sometimes he was simply called clear-eyed, and everyone understood who we were talking about. Alyosha's character was different from that of Pavel Kromov, who was hot and irrepressible by nature. Steady and taciturn, Adrov quickly established himself as an excellent marksman. He was then the first to be entrusted with independent hunting. The Komsomol organization contributed a lot to the combat training. In those days we held an open Komsomol meeting on the topic on increasing the activity of Komsomol members in the defence. The meeting was held not far from the front line, in the dried-up, overgrown-with-bushes channel of the river Mius. The communists and the company's combat personnel were invited. People came to the meeting with machine guns, rifles, grenades, ready on the signal to take a fighting position. Joseph Kalinovich Tuz made a report. He told about the situation at the front, about the May Day order of the Supreme Commander-in-Chief, about the specific tasks of the soldiers. We must lead an active defence, said the speaker. What does it mean? The answer is simple. None of us must not give rest to the enemy. This is especially true for snipers. A sniper is called a sniper because he knows the weapon perfectly. The report excited the fighters. There was a serious, business-like conversation about what should be done to increase activity in the defence. Obviously, it was not without criticism. I remember how snipers Bazanov and Kromov criticised their young comrade Klimenko, who, neglecting the measures of caution, climbed an open tree to better see the target and almost died from a bullet of an enemy shooter. They criticised the shooter Onishchenko for the fact that he does not take good care of his weapon, does not lubricate it in time, rarely cleans the channel of the rifle barrel. The bullet will clean it, Onishchenko waved away. And then many people started talking. Everyone did not like his remark. The rifle must be watched. The strength of the warrior in his weapon, said Komsomol members. It should be said that Onishchenko learned from the criticism. Then he and the weapon diligently looked after, in honestly fulfilling his military duty. Unhappy sat at this meeting sniper Mamadov. It turns out that that day his hunting was unsuccessful. And the matter was as follows. Mamadov saw a well-camouflaged single trench and watched carefully. The fascist, who was there, suspected something and started to look out of the trench like a gopher. He would look out, hide, then look out again. Mamadov fired in a hurry. Judging by the way the German quickly dived into the trench, the sniper realised that he missed, but continued to watch. And suddenly he saw the fascist waving a trowel. The Russian did not hit. This hit Mamadov in the heart. At the meeting, Mamadov, speaking about the caution and sharpness of the sniper, told about this case. To ironic remarks of comrades, he answered, I will pierce his sheep's head with a bullet anyway. Sniper Mamadov paid off the Hitlerite in full, but it cost him many days of patience and mortal risk. At the meeting, it was also about cleanliness in the trenches, in which we now spent day and night. Part Torg Company Senior Sergeant V. Labutin set an example of soldiers who kept their trenches in exemplary order. And in this case, said the Part Torg, Komsomol members should set the tone. The meeting did not pass for us without a trace. Combat activity of young soldiers began to grow every day, not lagged behind and shooters of my group. With the permission of the commander, they went out more and more often on a real hunt. From scouts it became known that against us in the defence is the same 16th German Motor Division, previously badly damaged, but again replenished. It's the brown bear again. Only his behaviour is different now. He prefers to sit more in the den. It's harder to hit him, Kromov said. Yes, we'll have to lure him out. And how? We'll figure it out. We began to hunt together. One of us, shooting from the barrier, deliberately revealed himself by the raised dust. And then a scarecrow would appear, a tree stump with a helmet on it. Mamadov was moving the scarecrow. 
and Kromov, Adrov and Petrishchev were watching the enemy trenches. A shot sounds. Mamadov puts out the scarecrow. Bullets click on the boulder above Mamadov's head. Aha! exclaims Kromov excitedly. They're shooting from the embrasure, over there. The window of the embrasure darkened and then suddenly brightened. More, Kromov asks with signs. Once again the shot rattles and the scarecrow flashes over the bunker. In the embrasure darkened. Sniper Kromov is aiming carefully. It is difficult to hit the embrasure with one shot. Difficult, but necessary. Kromov, holding his breath, pulls the trigger. There is no return shot. At night, the 2nd Battalion was transferred to the area opposite Matviv Kurgan, to the left of our old position. Like Tai, the enemy occupied the heights on the western bank of the Mius. Only in one place, where the 5th Company and one platoon of the 4th Company stood, the western elevated part of the bank was in our hands. The whole of it was riddled with gullies. On the eastern shore, on the other hand, a small forest, shrubbery and gardens were green. Here were sheltered our wagons and battalion headquarters. We explored the front in detail. In three days, snipers knew where and how many enemy pillboxes, bunkers, rifle cells, what kind of folds of terrain there were. Nothing escaped our attention. Neither a newly dug cell in the trenches at night, nor a tin can thrown on the berm, nor a trench periscope tube shining in an unfamiliar place. Everything was carefully viewed through a telescopic sight. One morning we noticed a bump, as if a boil had sprung up on the ground. We also noticed that it was covered with dry grass and a black hole was gaping on the side. This bump was going into the neutral zone quite far from the line of enemy trenches. We could distinguish a communication passage going to it, covered with camouflage netting. The loosened soil was hardly visibly through the net. The hillock was nothing more than a camouflaged firing point, which would surely be active only at the critical moment of the battle. A dangerous hillock, Alyosha Adrov remarked. We should inform the regimental artillerymen about it. Yes, the sniper is called not only to personally destroy the Nazis, but also to scout and timely report on the spotted firing points and we pass the coordinates through the company commander to the artillery men, and in an hour shells compare the enemy firing point to the ground, remembered and such a case. Senior Lieutenant Tuz, who closely monitored the combat work of snipers, almost every night met with us at the CP, asked about the hunt, gave advice, set tasks for tomorrow. In one of these meetings we reported that in the area of the village Shaposhnikove shooters of the 6th Company strongly annoyed enemy pillboxes with large calibre machine guns. Neither mines nor bullets do not take them. Adrov sadly waved his hands. This obviously armoured hoods, said Agess Kromov. Perhaps, agreed Ace. And do not tame them with anti-tank guns? Tried it. Nothing works. Tuz thought for a moment. The flame from the smokestack flickered and wavered, illuminating his concentrated face for a moment. Here's what, friends? He turned to us. We should establish the coordinates of these pillboxes more precisely. Let's try to suppress them with fire from anti-tank guns. Tuz immediately called the artillerymen and ordered me to lead the reconnaissance, Staff Sergeant Alexander Lugovoy, commander of the anti-tank gun, freckled, agile boy, looked for me at dawn. Shall we start? We took a convenient position and began to study the front line. The senior sergeant mapped all the pillboxes and bunkers. He found a convenient firing position. Tomorrow we will give them heat, he said with confidence. First give, and then say, I skeptically responded to the artilleryman's boast. The senior sergeant was not embarrassed by my answer. Be calm, sniper. We artillerymen also have a trained eye. Let's quickly shut the throats of these fascist pillboxes. On the advice of the commander, the gun crew had to roll out the cannon at dawn and shoot the pillboxes at close range. The risk was considerable. Enemy machine gunners could put the gun crew out of action before it opened fire. 
It was necessary to act quickly, skillfully and surely. Snipers and machine gunners had to help in a difficult moment artillery, men with accurate shots at the Nazi machine guns. At night, the infantrymen helped the artillerymen to dig a caponia, a shelter for the guns. It was reassuring that in the morning the tops of the heights where the enemy pillboxes were located were exposed first of all. In the lowlands at this time there is still fog. The fascists will not immediately detect the gun. The fire of the artillerymen, as it was supposed by the commander, was a complete surprise for the enemy. Two pillboxes were put out of action in the first minute. One sub-caliber and shrapnel shell was fired into each embrasure. The third pillbox was hit by four shells and was destroyed. Emboldened by their success, the artillerymen opened fire on the zots and trenches where enemy soldiers were seen. When the enemy returned artillery fire, the crew quickly rolled the gun into the caponier. During the fire raid, five zots were destroyed, spotted by snipers. A week later, I met at a meeting of agitators Senior Sergeant Alexander Lugovoy, commander of the gun crew. On his chest shone a brand new medal for bravery. I got it for those pillboxes, he boasted. The whole calculation was awarded with medals. I shook hands with the artillerymen, risk after risk, on May 10th, 1943. The 130th Rifle Division was formed on the basis of two separate rifle brigades, 159th and 156th. Its 528th Rifle Regiment was commanded by our former brigade commander, Lieutenant Colonel M. I. Dubrovin. On one of May days, I was called by the regiment commander and awarded the Order of the Red Star. Screwing the order to the jacket, he said, Although the regiment has enough to do, I do not forget about snipers, and from now on beat Hitlerites mercilessly. I hope you will justify the trust of the Soviet people. The words of the regiment commander, his high spirits, passed to me. I returned to the front line together with Alexander Ukrainsky, who for bravery and courage, shown in the battles for Batysk, was also awarded the Order of the Red Star. Already in an hour we arrived at our home, a long trench with cells for shooters, and received warm congratulations from comrades. And again stretched the days of trench life, full of anxiety and danger. One day at dawn, having received the company commander's permission, I decided together with snipers Alexei Adrov and Pavel Kromov to sneak into the neutral strip, where there was a dilapidated barn. San Instructor Petty Officer Herkoshenko followed us. I want to hunt for the Krauts, and again I'll help you. If someone is wounded, I'll help you. I didn't know him much, and in general, an extra man on the hunt an extra target for the enemy. But nevertheless, I dared not refuse him. He really wanted to come with us. We crawled safely through the shelled area, and here we are in the barn. Its walls are made of large limestone stone. Bullets won't take them. Mines and shells are another matter. But the barn is close to the positions, and German artillerymen and mortarmen, of course, are afraid to hurt their own so we are invulnerable. True, enemy infantry can attack the barn, but our machine gunners are also on guard. They'll help us with flanking fire. We made holes in the wall. Through them we can aim with snipers. The area we can see is small, but there are two bunkers opposite us. They are about 200 metres away. The windows of the bunkers are illuminated by the rays of the rising sun. This is to our advantage, if the embrasure darkens, it means that someone is watching or aiming through it. Alyosha Adrov was the first to fire. I don't know exactly whether he killed a fascist or not, but we were immediately spotted. The real duel began. As soon as it got dark in the embrasures, we fired and got a shot in return. A risk, of course. But there's risk everywhere on the front. Reloading my rifle, I leaned to the right for a second, and a bullet flew into my embrasure. It exploded with a crack, hitting the opposite wall. But now Kromov's shot sounded. In the trench of the enemy, flashed helmets. Obviously, the Hitlerites are fiddling with the dead or wounded. Let me shoot, asks Herkushenko. He does not have time to shoot. The bullet, having caught the edge of the hole in the wall, 
crumbles the stone. Perkoshenko falls to the ground and covers his face with his sleeve. Oh, my eyes! They knocked out my eyes! I can't see anything! We give him first aid, rinse his eyes with water from a flask. I see! exclaims excitedly Herkoshenko. It's covered with dust! Wait a minute, damn kraut! I won't leave it like that. A tooth for a tooth, an eye for an eye. Give me the sniper. Petty officer Herkoshenko is from the Ukraine. He served somewhere near the border. At the beginning of the war, he was hit by a shrapnel in his left arm, and more than once he showed us a long purple scar, a trace of the wound. We paralysed both bunkers with our fire. Nobody risked to shoot from there any more, but Hitlerites went on a stratagem. From the neighbouring bunkers, which were not visible to us, they began to shoot incendiary bullets on the dry boards of the roof of the barn. And in the attic of the barn was stored hay. Soon it burst into flames and the roof became a torch. There was nothing to put out the fire. Smouldering heads and fiery bits of hay were now falling on our heads. We are in the crematorium, Alyosha said with a bitter grin. There's only one way out, I suggest, to retreat to ours by short runs. Now we'll be shot like partridges, objected Karomov. That's what they're waiting for. To confess, we were most afraid of snipers' shot. We knew its grave consequences. But to all appearances, the enemy did not have a sniper here. And I reassured my friends. From our trench, they were waving helmets. Run, they said. We will support you with fire. I'll run first, volunteered the orderly. Having sprung for a jump, Herkushenko suddenly pressed himself against the wall in indecision. Our machine gun was long. He waved his hand and rushed at full speed to his own, hobbling like a hare. Two earth fountains of bullets rose on his left. Herkushenko shrieked, stopped for a moment, picked up his left arm with his right, but immediately fell and rolled into the trench. Alive or killed? Risk is risk. In war, you can't do without it, I thought. And immediately I jumped off, fell not far from the trench and rolled into it. I fall on my comrade's hands, Adrov falls on me, and Kromov after him. We feel ourselves. Are not wounded? In the heat of the moment, you may not notice. Safe! Pavel exhales with relief. We hear Herkushenko moaning, who is being bandaged by a tall fighter, having taken a bandage from his own medical bag. We are surprised to see that the bullet hit the scar of his left arm. Katie, crawling bastards, how did they get in that place? Is there some kind of magnet embedded here? Herkushenko grumbles for a long time, and we watch the roof of the barn collapsing with a rumble. Another time, it was already in June, we chose a position on the northern side of the village of Demidovka. We laid down at dawn. At noon, I found out that a Hitlerovite was walking along the path to the ravine. In his hands he was holding woks. He walks lazily, as if he's not at war. How could I miss such prey? I aim my sniper scope at him. I'm aiming for his chest. I pull the trigger. The Hitler falls, the kettles roll down the path, and I can't stop thinking why this fascist appeared on the path in the daytime, and even so confidently. After all, the Germans walked along it only at night. During the day they didn't dare, they were afraid of us. And this one? So he didn't know we had the pace in our sights. And if that's the case, he must be new. Maybe the Germans have a new unit in their defence. And I remembered Lieutenant Stanov, who said that a sniper is not only a very good marksman, but also an attentive observer and an excellent scout. I reported my observations to the company commander. In the same spirit spoke and snipers Adrov, Bazanov and Kromov. Soon the scouts of the division took the tongue, which showed that here arrived the 17th Grenadier Division. It was commanded by General Lyash. The division was relocated from France, and its soldiers, accustomed to easy victories in Western Europe, only hearsay knew about the Soviet-German front. Measures taken on the basis of intelligence, unfortunately, belated. In the second half of June, 
after a powerful artillery attack on the positions occupied by the 1st and 2nd Battalions of the 528th Rifle Regiment, the Grenadiers went on the attack. The forces were unequal, and our units were forced to withdraw from the heights. A shell burst damaged Semamachukov's Maxim. Two from the calculation were wounded. Hitlerites were rushing around the height, killing our wounded. At each of our shots, the fascists opened a barrage of fire. We lay down in the lowland in hastily dug trenches, having kept a bridgehead on the western bank of Mius. The snipers now had many targets, but there was no less danger. Behind a bush near the broken trench, a Hitlerovite crouched down near the dead man and began to pull off his boots. I won't let the bastard loot, I decided. I shoot, and the enemy's nose hit the ground. I transfer the threads of the sight to the German officer. I fire again, the officer goes down. But then, somewhere nearby, explosions rumble. I'm thrown upwards by the blast waves. Fortunately, I'm unharmed. But our artillery opened fire on the height occupied by the enemy. We cheered up. We received a command. Counter-attack the enemy. Recapture previously lost positions. The fascists rained fire of all kinds of weapons on us. We suffered losses. Would we have to retreat to the eastern shore at night? But then, Katyusha's hit the fascists. Fountains of fire danced. The grenadiers trembled, and we retook our positions on the heights. But the enemy didn't stop. A chain of grenadiers soon appeared in front of us. We pinned them to the ground with rifle and machine gun fire. The chain thinned and fell back. Here our snipers did a great job. Here is what our division newspaper for the Motherland wrote on June 19, 1943. True heroism was shown by Red Army man A. V. Adrov. After each destroyed German, he joyfully exclaimed, Take that, you bastard, two metres. So the brave warrior for a day of fighting killed 16 Hitlerites. Sniper Yegor Mefodievich Bajanov, who destroyed 13 fascists in fights in the area of a boom factory, also distinguished himself. Both snipers were awarded with the Order of the Red Star. Defence in our area again stabilised. We continued to hunt, changing position after position. The soccer match was disrupted. For a short rest, we settled down in a cellar made of grey limestone stone, which there were many in the village of Demidovka. We were fortified with dry rations, breadcrumbs and American stew. The cellar was cool and cosy. The atmosphere, one could say, was conducive to intimate conversation. Such moments are the most appropriate time when the Komsorga can talk to people. I took out of my pocket the issue of the magazine Agitator's Notebook, thumbed through it. Let's listen to the word of Thomas Smyslov. In the magazine regularly printed Reshnik, loved by the fighters. And this time the snipers listened with interest to the old soldier Smyslov, his story about frontline affairs, full of jokes and quips. And our guys had a sharp word, and we laughed a lot. And laughter is, if you want, a new charge of vigour. During leisure hours we read newspapers, magazines and, of course, letters from our relatives. Often we read these letters together, sharing the most intimate things. Who is the letter from? Kromov asked Alyosha Adrov when he saw a triangle envelope in his hands. From my mother. Read it aloud, the friends asked, and if something is purely personal, skip it. Alyosha's mother told him that there was a good harvest in the Volga region, but it was difficult to collect wheat. In the villages, there were only old and small people. Past the Station Kumilga, she wrote, there are trains with the wounded and I've lost my eyes. I keep looking to see if you're there, Alyosha. When will I see you, my son? Alyosha turned away, crumpled up the letter, tears glistened in his eyes. It's nothing, friend, don't be discouraged, I reassured Alyosha. Hitler and his army will not be spared. You and I have snipers, and your score is over 40. Write to your mother about it, my friends advised Alyosha. Let the countrymen know about your military deeds, and that you received the Order of the Red Star. Senior Lieutenant Nikolai Rybalko, the battalion commander's assistant, 
entered the basement. You are sitting here, he angrily blurted out, and the Krauts are playing soccer under our noses. We jumped up from our seats. Where? What Krauts? What soccer? I'm not kidding, reduced the ardor Ribalco. Scouts reported. Behind the eastern slope of the height, in the gully near the oak tree, Hitlerites are playing soccer. It's out of order. It's clear that it's out of order. But how so? Kromov was perplexed. The front and... soccer? We headed for the northern outskirts of Demidovka. The trench led us along the western bank of the Mius. At the place where the trench, like the river, makes a loop, we met a tall fighter with kind grey eyes. Where are you going, sniper boys? he inquired. To play soccer with the Krauts. The grey-eyed fighter looked at our faces incredulously. Do you have any tobacco? He asked, convinced, obviously, that he would not get anything useful out of us. The Ukrainian accent, the words no tobacco, and the tall height of the gunman reminded me of someone. But who? Grinchenko, of course. Pantelemon Grinchenko. It was he who once stood in this very trench. In the spring, the fourth company was in defence here. Now it's the sixth. Alyosha Adrov gave the grey-eyed soldier some makhoka, and I couldn't get rid of the sudden memories. Pante Lymon Grinchenko. He was a thin, oblong-faced fighter. He came from Rostov, where his large family remained. By character, Grinchenko was direct and open, a little even sharp. My first acquaintance with him took place in the spring in his shooting cell. Stopping, I looked at the high bumper. What a trench you have dug for yourself. Deep. It is not a deep trench, and you shallow? Grinchenko replied angrily. He immediately swore hard, throwing a cigarette butt on the ground, which gave off an unpleasant odour. There is not even any tobacco. What are our rear guards thinking about? Wait for the delivery. No patience, I remarked. Grinchenko looked at me reproachfully. The grey-haired fighter reproached him, a former front-line soldier, for his lack of patience. You are so quick, he quickly spoke. Do you know that I have enough patience until Berlin? Why are you swearing? I did not give up. Grinchenko found a crumpled piece of paper in his pocket, poured some dried grass and began to roll a cigar. Here, take a drag. He shoved it to me. It hurts my throat. I don't have any tobacco, so I swear. Maybe there's an official in the rear. You'd better ask, Komsorg. In the evening, meeting with the commander, I told him about the fighter's urgent need, and three days later we were again in the trench, where there was Grinchenko's cell. He was diligently cleaning his rifle. When he saw me, he revived. They say that you, on behalf of us, smoking, with the commander, spoke to the combatant. Thank you, Komsorg. Mahoroshka was delivered. Grinchenko was ready to talk, but Adrov and I were in a hurry to a new position. Then we met him many times. Once German scouts snuck into our trenches, Grinchenko was the first to notice them. I look, they are crawling through the flowering garden, said Grinchenko. They don't see me. Bushes interfere with them. How to kill Hitlerites. They had one breakthrough to our trench. An anti-tank grenade came to hand. The first three were blown to pieces. The fourth rushed back. He was hit by a bullet. German scouts were counting on surprise. They wanted to attack us at lunchtime. It didn't work. Our soldiers were joking. The Kraut went to lunch, but went to the other world. Pantelimon Grinchenko was awarded the Order of the Red Star for his brave deed. At noon, Grinchenko himself died. He was brought to the company's control room still alive. He lay for a few minutes, trying to tell something about the children, and died in full consciousness. I could not believe that people could die so easily. Grinchenko had a large family and irrepressible love for it. He almost every day received letters from his wife and adult children. It seemed that this love firmly bound him to life. And suddenly Grinchenko was gone. He was buried in the forest in a small clearing, about twenty metres from the river Meuse. Senior Lieutenant Tuz said deftly, Accept. The land of Meuse the body of a faithful son of the fatherland. May the earth rest on your soul. Alyosha Adrov sat at the freshly dug grave, pensive and depressed. 
In his eyes, it seemed, the blueberry had disappeared. The young oaks were making noise, the grass was lushly green, and in our souls snake crawled longing. By the evening of the second day after the funeral, we came to the grave of our comrade-in-arms. Bending over, Adrov dented into the ground empty brass casings. Here, he said, our revenge to the enemy for you. We continued along the trench that led us into the forest. On a rope bridge we crossed to the eastern bank of the river. At the edge of the forest there's a gully. In spring it is flooded with water, and in summer it dries up, overgrown with reeds. There are no trenches in the reeds, but here we put out reinforced patrols. We knew the enemy's front line was heavily mined, girdled with barbed wire, behind which there was a small hill, and then a flat field began. You couldn't see all this because of the reeds, and if you climbed a tree. True, the edge of the forest was probably viewed by the enemy observers, and most likely was shot by his machine gunners. Climbing a tree is a risk, shooting from a tree is a double risk, and as if to confirm this thought, a machine gun burst was heard. It was fired from the northern slope of the height. Bullets went through the top of the oak tree. Dry twigs and unripe acorns fell at our feet. We examined the oak. Its limbs were riddled with bullets. And it was this oak that we had to climb. It's the tallest, the outermost one. I climb the first limb. I'm not afraid. Not all the time the enemy observer looks at this oak. Behind me climbs Adrov, and below remained on my instructions Kuromov, to cover. Here we are almost at the very top. I fall to the scope. And what do I see? Germans on a green lawn playing ball. I feel angry. Occupants are playing soccer on our land. I'm looking at Alyosha Adrov. He is a little lower, also sees everything and is also indignant at the insolence of the fascists. Far away, regrets Adrov, 800 metres. Set the sight, I tell him. Load a heavy bullet, two shots, and down, shots rattle. We can see how Hitlerites scattered. Some rushed to the dead, others lay down. It's time for us to take cover. We jump from bow to bow, and then to the ground. At the top of the oak tree opened fire fascist machine gunners. We run away to the side. The game is over. Four. Zero in our favour, exclaims Alyosha. We return by a forest path which leads us to Grinchenko's grave. At the suggestion of Pavlik Kromov, we leave four empty shell casings on the grave of our comrade-in-arms. When our sortie was reported to the battalion headquarters, the commander frowned his eyebrows. Too risky, he said. After all, soccer fans are easier to cover with artillery. And, turning to the chief of staff, added... Snipers to declare in the order of gratitude, but we were not without losses. One of the summer days was especially hard. Before lunch, sniper Klimenko was seriously wounded, and by evening Pavlik Kromov was mortally wounded. The sniper's bullet pierced his left shoulder and lodged somewhere in his chest. When they brought Pavlik on a stretcher to the Muse Cliff, where the medical station was located, he was still alive. Seeing us, Kromov revived whispered clearly. Goodbye. Beat them. I wanted to embrace my friend and tell him something comforting and affectionate, that you, Pavlik, had done a good job. Your conscience before the fatherland is clean. You're out of action, but your friends are still alive. We'll continue to count the killed fascists. We'll avenge our comrades' blood, we swore. Two or three days later, Alyosha Adrov, hiding in the thick crown of an oak tree, tracked down the point where food was delivered to the German soldiers at dawn. Let's give them some porridge, said Vasily Petrishchev. Having put on camouflage tents, the three of us sat down in the trees. We conveniently adapted our rifles for shooting, and so the hours of waiting dragged on. At last, the kitchen rumbled. In the pre-dawn fog appeared the figures of Hitler's soldiers, one after another, shots rang out. Several fascists, we were not up to count, were hit by sniper bullets. Without a second's hesitation, we jumped from our seats. The boughs crackled. 
a commotion has risen among the Hitlerites. Their machine gunners opened indiscriminate firing, but we were already safe, sheltered behind oak trees. This is our Komsomol answer to Pavlik's death, says Alyosha Adrov. By evening, Dusty, Major Belkin, the regiment's deputy commander in charge of political affairs, came to our front line. I was just writing a letter to my mother, sitting in a trench. Regimental scouts took the tongue, said the Major. The prisoner admitted that they suffered a lot of damage from snipers, so be proud of your combat successes. Major Belkin told us that the fascists call Donbass the Russian Ruhr and the Mius Front, the Iron Gate covering Donbass from the east. Hitler cannot accept the death of his Sixth Army. Before us stands the army, which has the same number as the army of Paulus. All its regiments and formations have the same numbers as those defeated at Stalingrad, the Major told us. Will we go on the offensive soon? the soldiers asked. The offensive is not far off confidently answered Belkin. The deputy commander, talking with us, snipers, took a keen interest in our hunting and our everyday life. On his advice, I wrote a report on my sniper work to the regiment commander. Do not spare ammunition on the enemy, said shaking hands with us, the major. And turning to me, he added, and we will publish your report in the divisional magazine. And indeed, in the issue of the divisional newspaper for the Motherland from June 20, 1943, appeared my report to the regiment commander. Visiting the command In the evening of July 7th, when the firefight had subsided somewhat, Major Belkin, the regimental deputy commander, appeared in our trench again. Listen to the message of the Soviet Inform Bureau, he announced. The report said that to the west of Rostov-on-Don there was an artillery and mortar firefight. Our units here suppressed the fire of several artillery and mortar batteries, destroyed eleven dugouts and three enemy bunkers, then called the gunners of mortar units that blew up an enemy ammunition depot. All this in the strip of our army? someone asked. Of course, replied the Major, but you listen to what is said about our regiment, and he continued to read. For a month and a half, 37 snipers of the N part killed 472 German soldiers and officers. Sniper Peter Belyakov killed 101 Hitlerites, Alexei Adrov, 66, sniper Pavel Kromov killed 65 Germans. The words of the deputy policeman could hardly fit in my head. Now the whole country knows about me, a guy from Stalingrad region. My mother, father, acquaintances will read it. I was over the moon. In the companies were held talks, Komsomol meetings, which proclaimed calls to mercilessly exterminate the Nazi invaders, to keep equal to the snipers. Among the fighters increased desire to learn to shoot accurately. The commander called on the phone. I come, pick up the phone. Ace reports that I was awarded the military rank of sergeant and that I am called 25th, Regimental Commander Dubrovan. Do not forget to inform the company commander about it, reminds the commander. Senior Lieutenant Poeton did not really like it when someone was recalled from the company. Here and now, he noticed, your fame will take you away from the company. Eh? Would know the commander? How I was attached to his company. I had no thought of leaving it. But I kept quiet. In Staraya Rotovka, where the regiment headquarters was located, I reached with difficulty. Everywhere the ground was riddled with trenches and communication lines. Somewhere I had to crawl on my stomach so as not to damask the new trenches. However, I'm not used to it. I crawled, making short runs from one house to another, from one trench to another. There is no resentment against those who shush me. A trench is a soldier's fortress, and this fortress is supported not only by walls, but also by camouflage. Finally, I got to the regiment's CP. Lieutenant Colonel M.I. Dubrovin met me joyfully. He hugged me tightly. Now I will report about you to the 74th, he said. 74th is the division commander, Colonel K.V. Sikev. While Dubrovin calls, I examine the dugout. It is clean, cosy. 
On the top chan lies harmonica. On the table a bouquet of fresh wildflowers. I spontaneously observe the regiment commander. He seems to me quite young. However, he is really young. Mikhail Ilyich Dubrovin was 27th year. The commander of the division invites me to his place. We go along the trench to the gully where a Willis is waiting for us. We sit down and rush towards Lysogorka. A large caliber shell bursts nearby. Clods of earth fly up and we are hit by a hot wave of air. Fascist artillerymen, obviously, noticed the car. Hold on, sniper. Dubrovin winks at me. On the front line there are bullets and mines, but here you see what kind of stuffed animals are bursting. We overcome the shelled area at high speed. We come out on the road, on both sides of which rye fallow rye is ripening. Something peaceful. I'm used to this kind of environment. I noticed a group of soldiers walking without ducking down on the field, measuring something. How is it possible to walk at full height? By habit, I determine the distance to them. We are at the division control centre. From the neighbouring room comes a bass voice. In the ajar door, I see a tall and full colonel in a field uniform. Listen, the division commander is talking about you, nodded towards the door Dubrovin. Indeed, the commander called my name. Now he will be here, a soldier as a soldier, 18 years old. In short, a young man but destroyed a company of Nazis. Isn't that a hero? We all need to work with the same vigour as the soldiers on the front line. Is that clear? Clearly meant the end of the meeting. Everyone noisily left the room and surrounded us. And I couldn't recover from the confusion. I didn't feel comfortable being praised like that. And not anyone but the division commander himself. Worried and meeting with him. But the commander turned out to be a simple, friendly man. Coming up to me, he shook my hand and invited me to the dugout to have dinner. In the dugout, upholstered with cloak tents, an electric lamp was burning. It smelled of Don Time, which was scattered on the floor. Apparently, the division commander liked the smell of field herbs. On the table, in aluminum plates, was a snack. Canned fish, stew and radish and cucumbers. Colonel Gazis Lukmanov, the head of the division's political department, came up to meet us, a Kazakh by nationality, with the new Order of the Red Banner on his chest. Next to him stood a general unfamiliar to me. At dinner I was asked about the hunt for the Nazis, about the mood of the fighters, about the behaviour of the enemy and many other things. Finally Colonel Sikhev got up from the table, and at that moment he seemed to me especially tall and strong. It's good that the fascists are bending their heads, they are afraid of us. Time, he said with a significant emphasis on the word. This is not the 41st. Well, thank you, Dubrovin, for raising eagles. Present the sniper for an award. I slept the night in the dugout of the division commander, and in the morning I was dropped off alone by car to Staraya Rotovka, and from there I got to the front line. In the company was waiting for me sad news. Alyosha Adrov, my battle friend, fellow countryman and peer, was seriously wounded. Everybody loved Alyosha. He never got discouraged, he was friendly with everyone. His bright blue eyes seemed to radiate kindness and joy. There are people in the world who, once you see them, you remember all your life. Alyosha Adrov, a sniper of the 528th Rifle Regiment, undoubtedly belonged to such people. You've lost your students. Well, war is not without losses. It's a pity. They were good boys, Tuz told me sadly, when I arrived at the battalion's CP on his orders. I once again thought hard. Is it my fault? After all, a lot of people had dropped out of the line, and those who remained walked marked by bullets or shrapnel. Fate kept me safe, and I wondered at myself, in what bindings I was, and still alive. Ace put his hands on my shoulders in a fatherly way. We'll live yet, Petrushka. A bullet has not yet been cast for us in German factories, and your friends have done a good job. If only everyone fought like that. We'll make up a new team of snipers. Tuzi's idea failed to materialise. Soon he was badly wounded. Iosif Kalinovich was taken to the hospital. 
On one of the hot days, I loaded my rifle with a clip of heavy bullets, the tips of which were coloured yellow. I looked through the German front line. Would a stray Hitler or Weit get caught in the crosshairs? As luck would have it, the enemy behaved very cautiously, as if he guessed about my plan. At noon, I noticed three helmets lying next to each other on the barrier. Are you going to have lunch? Well, I'll spoil the fascists' appetite. One by one, I knocked down the helmets with bullets, and they jumped into the trench like frogs from the shore. And behind me, someone is laughing. I look back. It is the assistant of the commander, Senior Lieutenant Rybalko, who sincerely loved me and called me no other way than Senior. He has a big trophy binoculars in his hands. You're angry, I see. What do you need them for, those helmets? Let them know that on our land an occupant can't have a quiet lunch, I answer. You're right, senior. The Krauts probably now look at the holes in the helmets and praise their goth mit uns that saved them from a Russian bullet. And I'll put more than one hole in their heads, I assure them, reloading my rifle. Revenge In the first days of August, our battalion took the line, which was opposite the village of Shaposhnikov. The commander of the 2nd platoon, Junior Lieutenant Valery Mirogorodsky, was out of action because of a wound, and I was offered to temporarily take over the platoon. The defence occupied by the platoon was very difficult. We were on the slope of the height, the fascists were on the height itself, 80-90 metres away from use. The ground here is stony. We got trenches, dug not in full height. In some places we had to crawl through them. The platoons were not connected by a continuous trench, and with the first platoon we were separated by a small gully. Our front line was not mined, so the enemy at any time could take active combat actions, to try to capture the tongue, to attack us unexpectedly, to throw grenades. However, the fascists were afraid of the same thing. At night they illuminated the neutral strip with rockets that fell behind our trenches, because the neutral zone was very small. Sometimes the fascists opened furious fire out of the blue, obviously trying to demoralise us, and once they shelled us with heavy artillery. At about noon, a shell exploded behind our trench. The ground shook, and a column of fire and stone fragments soared upward. Part of the trench collapsed, we were stunned and covered with thick dust. The second shell hit the German trench and the third fell in the neutral. At this point, the fire stopped. Apparently, Hitlerites realised that the shelling from heavy guns is more dangerous, perhaps, for themselves. But they got accustomed to shelling us with grenade launchers. At night, as usual, nobody slept on the front line, and during the day when people rested, there were observers and machine gunners on duty, and in broad daylight three platoon observers were killed one after another. All three from bullet hits in the head below the helmet. It was clear that a sniper was working against us, and I immediately reported it to the company commander. Put a hole in that sniper's head, answered indignantly Senior Lieutenant Pohiton, but I forbid you to leave the platoon. You can instruct. Then something crackled in the receiver, and Pohiton put it down. I could understand his anger. I'm ordering you to observe only through trench periscopes, it was decided at night to transport the bodies of the dead soldiers across the Meuse for burial. And something presses in my chest. I'm choking with excitement. Does it matter who catches on the fly of the enemy sniper? I'm thinking. The important thing is to take him down, to destroy by all means. I'll do it. I'll do it myself. My sniper rifle lay in an alcove covered by a raincoat. These days I've been walking around with a machine gun. It's easier for the commander but the thought of avenging the enemy for the death of comrades did not give rest. And I again armed myself with a sniper. Where to choose a position? Behind the girder on the neutral line I could see a dilapidated building. It's either a summer house or storage for fruits and vegetables. To penetrate to it was not worth much work, though not without risk. The house could be ambushed, it could be mined, but you can't do without risk at the front. I call the platoon commander, Sergeant Pecker. I explain what measures to take if anything happens to me. 
machine gunners were given the task to be ready to cover the sortie. At noon, when the sun began to burn, the vigilance of observers usually blunted, but I realised that the enemy sniper has our trench in his sights, looking for the next victim. Most likely, he was using the embrasure of some pillbox. I crawl through the grass. I look inside the house. It's empty. Nothing dangerous. I don't use the window facing the enemy. I might be detected. I pull a brick out of the wall. I put my sniper in the opening. The enemy trench is no more than 70, 80 metres away. But the periscope magnifies objects four times. So the fascists seem to be some 20 metres away from me. From such a distance I shot down a heel with a bullet, extinguished a candle. Missing is excluded. The sun was shining brightly on the pillbox, and the embrasure opening seemed dark and ominous. I hear Sergeant Pecker in German start transmitting into a tin horn. Achtung! Achtung! I hear him say. Deutsche Soldaten! I keep my eyes on the embrasure. There's something stirring in it. A second or two more and a rifle sticks out into the hole. But the fascist doesn't have time to shoot. A soldier appeared from the trench to the right of the pillbox. He's watching. He's looking at my house. So they guessed where I was shooting from. I pull the trigger. More and more helmets flashing over the trench. The enemy must be in an uproar. But I'm in no hurry to leave. I'm picking a new target. Here you are, you bastards for the death of your friends, for Pavel Kromov, for Alyosha Adrov's wounds, for my own brother, for everything. The store box is empty. I crawl back to the gully, to my trenches. Near the house, grenadies are bursting. The fascists are firing machine guns at it. Too late, I think, and wipe the sweat from my face. Something shouts into the mouthpiece Sergeant Pecker. Whether gloating over the impotence of the enemy, or calls his soldiers to surrender as prisoners, and I can't catch my breath and come to my senses from the excitement that has seized me. Comrade Petty Officer, Poheton is calling you. The telephonist answers the phone. What happened? Who stirred up the hornet's nest? asks the company commander. I'm reporting everything in detail. I told you not to leave. I didn't leave. The house is in my platoon's zone. The company commander changed his anger for mercy, praised me for my initiative, promised to report to the commander-in-chief. The next night an enemy grenade exploded in front of the trench in two or three steps, showering me with powder crumbs and small splinters. There were many wounds, but all not dangerous. I was lying on a stretcher and heard Senior Lieutenant Poheton reporting over the phone. Out of action. I begged the doctor, the same Ekaterina Ivanovna Lavrova, who had once been begged by Alyosha Adrov to leave me to be treated in the regiment's sanitary regiment. On a young body wounds heal quickly. In a week I was already on my feet. By that time our battalion was taken to the second echelon. It is very close to the Sontrote, and I went to visit my combat friends with the doctor's permission. The first person I met was Komsomolet Zavalishin, a machine gunner who had seen the sights. The trench of Yefreator, Mikhail Zavalishin, was in an orchard where Antonovka apple trees were growing. What a beauty it is. Every morning I admire the orchard, Mikhail said. Zavalishin jealously guarded the apple trees. He did not allow anyone to tear the fruit, which was full of juice. And I thought, a man in battle does not spare his life, and everything that pleases the eye is preserved for the sake of life. In the battalion did not waste time. Carefully studied small arms, went to training attacks, improving techniques of close combat. At dawn, sergeants and petty officers took young fighters to the gully. There were shooting. Admittedly, all of us were tired of sitting in the trenches. We were eager to fight. The victorious battle at the Kursk Bulgy aroused admiration. Now the offensive on the southern front was just around the corner knew the enemy. The morning of August 18th was warm and quiet. Fog lazily drifted along the valleys of Meuse. The forest was dozing. But the silence did not last long. Soon flashes of shots flashed all along the front line. 
and the Meuse land rumbled. Fountains of artillery fire and smoke rose into the sky. The centuries-old stone cracked and crumbled. Over the Black Raven Mound hovered assault aviation, crushing enemy fortifications. Our battalion in advance took the initial lines in close proximity to the enemy positions. Here, the enemy's fire points were hit by anti-tank guns and battalion mortars. Above the trenches flashed a red rocket. Attack! Follow me! commanded the company commander, and springily jumped up on the berm. The soldiers rushed after him, firing on the move from automatic rifles and carbines. And now there was a desperate fight. Hitlerites, unable to withstand, left the first line of trenches. Then, however, they recovered from fright and made counterattacks. In the fierce battle, none of us trembled. The first target of Hitlerites was literally slaughtered by friendly fire of machine gunners and riflemen. The enemy counterattack was smothered in the second and third time. German observers detected the machine gun of Sergeant Marchukov. Around him began to burst shells. The machine gun toppled over. Soldiers of the calculation were killed. In that difficult moment, the sergeant was not confused. He tidied up the Maxim, and when the Nazis rose in another counterattack, pressed the trigger. The shells were bursting, showering the machine gun with earth and shrapnel, but Semyon Marchukov fired. He was found after the battle seriously wounded and sent to the hospital. Battalions of the 528th Rifle Regiment, though slowly, were moving forward. The regiment's CP from Staraya Rotovka was moved to the Miuskie Heights, from where the battlefield was clearly visible. Here now there was also the banner of the regiment. On August 30th, 1943, the front troops liberated Taganrog and rushed further to the west, knocking down the enemy's outposts, bypassing and destroying its strongholds. It was not far from Mariupol. The enemy had gained a foothold on the high ground. We knew that in the rear of Hitlerites to the west of Mariupol landed a detachment of sailors of Azov military flotilla, and we had to join the landing. Having scattered in a chain, we crawled forward. Suddenly, from three sides, enemy machine guns rumbled. One of them hit us almost in the back. The company commander was severely wounded. Several soldiers were killed. The situation became critical. Into the gully! Take cover! We heard a command and, looking back, saw an unfamiliar lieutenant with a machine gun in his hands. I order to the ravine. I have been appointed your commander, he announced loudly. The lieutenant acted quickly and decisively. Having gathered us in the ravine, he was preparing a rush across the shot field. I remember one of the older fighters noticed, it's easy to say, a rush, there are not enough of us and there is no artillery. I can see that there are few of us, but there are not too many enemies, said the lieutenant calmly. And we can't wait. Sailors are dying in unequal combat behind enemy lines. And, as if in confirmation of the lieutenant's words behind the cornfield, the firing became more frequent, explosions were heard. Do you hear that, friends? We can't wait. Let's help the sailors. Let's help them! came the voices. The lieutenant divided the soldiers into two groups. One of them ordered me to lead. The group was tasked to destroy the enemy, acting from the rear. There are no more krauts than a squad, the lieutenant instructed me. Give one of the men your sniper rifle. Take a machine gun. The commander needs it more in battle. The lieutenant was right in his own way. It's much more convenient to use a machine gun in an offensive battle. It's a rapid-fire weapon. Besides, it is difficult to combine the duties of both commander and sniper, but it is also not reasonable to stay without a sniper. With grief, I handed the sniper rifle to a soldier who had seen it for the first time. We went up to the attack at the same time. We rushed forward with friendship, pushing the cornstalks under us. Hooray! Hooray! But then a long machine gun rang out. Bursting bullets slammed. The men lay down. We suffered casualties. By the dust clouds, I quickly determined the location of the enemy machine gun, saw the machine gunners. Sniper! Give me the sniper! I shout, 
but that fighter is not around. A sniper rifle would come in handy now. Follow me. I jump up from the ground and shoot at the machine gun with my automatic rifle. The fighters have risen and are also opening fire. Retreat. They're running. There were cheers of triumph. Aha. They've fallen back. I exhaled. The lieutenant was right. There were few fascists here. We captured four of them. The firing stopped in the direction where the lieutenant was advancing with his group. How are things going there? Who defeated whom? We ran to the place where the lieutenant ordered to gather after the battle. The first one we saw was a wounded soldier. Where's the lieutenant? I asked him. The lieutenant is over there. He pointed in the direction of the girder. More and more wounded men were coming our way. Apparently, there had been a fierce fight. But where's the lieutenant? The cornfield seemed to break off. Ahead, fifty metres away, a clear field. Here and there the bodies of the dead, and here we see the lieutenant lying face down. His right hand was frozen on the forend of his automatic rifle. Nearby, near the broken machine gun, the corpses of four German soldiers. It was clear, overcoming the open area, the lieutenant and his men on the run fired at the machine gun. Many of them cost their lives. And I again regretted that the lieutenant did not have a sniper with him. It would have been possible to avoid unnecessary losses. The liaison Petrischev carefully took the lieutenant's documents out of his uniform pocket and handed them to me. Barantsev Nikolai, I read. Gorky region. Someone interrupted me anxiously. People were seen ahead. I put binoculars to my eyes. But they were already shouting, Sailors! Sailors! Then there were battles on the Molochnaya River, in Melitopol, on the Nikopol bridgehead, on the Dnieper, and from each battle I was firmly convinced that a sniper should remain a sniper. Remembering Friends of the Fighting On November 20th, 1943, when breaking through enemy defences at the Nikopol bridgehead, I was wounded again, but this time severely. I was in hospital for about a year. After being discharged, I joined the First Guards Army, in the ranks of which I reached Prague, but I did not have a chance to fight as a sniper. I was recognised as limited fit. Of course, he often remembered his battle friends from the 159th Rifle Brigade. After all, my fellow countrymen served in it. Many of them died in the battles, and those who survived are still working in factories, collective and state farms. In 1972, veterans' soldiers met in Volgograd. There was here and the first commander of our brigade, Reserve Colonel A.I. Bulgakov. I. Bulgakov. His chest is decorated with the Order of Lenin, two Orders of the Red Banner, the Order of the Red Star and many medals. He finished the war in Berlin as deputy commander of the 265th Rifle Division of the 3rd Shock Army, which directly participated in the storming of the Reichstag. A. I. Bulgakov is now an honorary citizen of the city of Zernograd, which was liberated by our brigade. Alexander Ivanovich lives in Volgograd. It was here, in his apartment on Chernyakovsky Street, and met veterans. And what was the fate of M. I. Dubrovin? Mikhail Ilyich commanded rifle units until the end of the war. He was awarded two orders of the Red Banner, Order of the Red Star, many medals. After retirement, he settled in the city of Kuibyshev. The military doctor of the regiment Ekaterina Ivanovna Lavrova, a native of Stalingrad, became his wife. Joseph Kalinovich Tuz also survived. The wound near Taganrog was heavy, and he became a war invalid. The former commander often recalls his last battle. With the help of tanks, we managed to break through the enemy's defence. It was very close to the city. Being carried away by the attack, we overtook the tanks. And suddenly, something heavy hit me on the arm. Ace is a Muscovite. I correspond with him, and he helped me to restore in my memory many events. In Volgograd, we met the sniper Spasivtsev. He lives in Kalachondon and works as a foreman of the District Consumer Union. It was not easy for me then in Rostov, Vladimir Vasilyevich told us. Cut off by tanks from the company on Engels Street, I, with the help of quick kids with difficulty, got to the station, 
where I joined the battalion of Senior Lieutenant Madian. Here from the windows and attic of the station room I fired from a sniper at the attacking fascist automatons. On February 11th, during the sortie at Verkhne Gnilovskaya, I was wounded. I lost consciousness. I was picked up by local women. They rendered first aid, helped me to get to my own. The meeting in Volgograd left an indelible trace in my memory. We were happy to see each other. There were so many memories of hard days of war, of fighting friends. We remembered G.K. Madoyan. For the battles in Rostov, he received the title of Hero of the Soviet Union. Then Gukas Karapetovich commanded a rifle brigade. During the liberation of Transcarpathia, he was seriously wounded. For many years, he worked as Minister of Social Security of the Armenian SSR. Now he is retired. He lives in Yerevan. And how not to remember the glorious snipers Dmitry Chechikov, Nikolai Nosov, Pavel Kromov, Alexei Adrov. Adrov's parents live at the station Kumilga, Volgograd region. His father, Vasily Andreevich, as precious relics, keeps clippings from front newspapers in which it was informed about Alexei's feats and awarding him with the Order of the Red Star. Having recovered after a heavy wound on Meuse, Alexei again got to the front. He fought bravely and heroically died in March 1944. About the last minutes of life of Alexei Vasilyevich Adrov wrote Pravda in the article Soldiers of the Offensive. It was like this. German tanks unexpectedly counterattacked our advancing units near the village of Kovalevka, Nikolaev region. Their main blow fell on the company, in which Alexei Adrov fought. He was the first to throw a grenade into the enemy tank. The fascist machine stopped. But Alyosha himself died in that battle. He was 19 years old then, and in my memory he has always remained young, bright-eyed and smiling. At the meeting of veterans came and my school and frontline friends, Gurov, Dronov, Marchukov. Ivan Gurov, a scout, now works as an agronomist in his native collective farm named after M. I. Kalinin. The collective farm is known as an advanced farm. Ivan Vasilyevich's merit in this is not insignificant. Pavel Dronov, after the battle near the farm, Bezvodny was in the hospital for a long time, received disability of the second group. But Dronov is not such a character to sit idly. Now he runs a club in the farm Ilmensky I of Mikhailovsky district, where he was born and grew up. Residents of Kagelnitskaya Villagi awarded him the title of honorary citizen of their village. Pavel Agapovich is a holder of the Order of Glory of the Thirdest Degree. The old Cossack Agap, Pavel's father, who encouraged us when we left for the army, died before his son returned from the war. And how happy his father would have been to know that we had fulfilled his father's instructions to the end. They said that Agap was thrilled to hear about our strong frontline friendship and our fighting deeds. He used to walk around the farm and say to everyone he met, These are the sons who have grown up on our land. They're fighting well. They don't disgrace the honour of their native farm and the Cossack glory. Machine gunner Semyon Marchukov was awarded the Order of Patriotic War of the I degree for his feet on the Meuse River. After a heavy wound he was treated for a long time. Both legs were amputated. But nothing broke the battle-hardened soldier. Semyon Pantelievich. Marchukov is still in service. He works as a chief accountant of the Office of Repair and Housing Construction in the town of Mikhailovka. Not all fellow countrymen returned from this war, but memory about them lives in hearts of people. In the farm Ilmensky I, next to the school, there is a stele. On it are inscribed the names of the fallen soldiers. Tanker Alexander Dolgov, burned in a tank near Belgrade, Ilya Dronov, brother Pavel, Grigory Belyakov, my brother and others. There are over a hundred of them. They gave their lives for our future. The Stanitsa Arkadinskaya is getting better every year. New residential houses, public buildings have risen on its streets. And among them there is a secondary school erected on the most prominent place. It is drowned in greenery. Needless to say, how dear to us everything that is connected with childhood, with learning. In front of me is a handwritten history of the school. 
On one of its pages, in columns, as in a class journal, are written the names of students, my peers. Vanya Gurov, Sasha Lestev, Vanya Balibadin, Vanya Zeleznikov, Sema Barishnikov, guys who stepped from the school bench directly to the front and took the first battle in their 18 years. The school year begins with a lesson of courage. This time it is conducted by the teacher of history, the participant of the great patriotic war, Vasily Yakovlevich Kupriakin. The children listen to the story, holding their breath. That's how we listened to our military teacher, A.P. Stavropoltsev. At school, as before, fun, noisy. But at lessons, discipline is strict. Guys diligently master knowledge, are engaged in sports. In high school, boys willingly study military science. Joyful becomes on the soul when you see these guys. A reliable replacement is growing up for us.